it, shall we? It is so good to be at church today. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. Good to see everybody. Amen. The title of this message today is the end sooner than we think. Yes, it is. Amen. All right. Now, we have evidences. The point, one of the points I want to make this morning is that there are so many evidences of the end is so close and even closer than what we think. And all you have to do is just look at what's going on in the world. Look what's happening, especially with people, and it becomes clearer. And one of the things that becomes clear is the presence of the absence of God. Now, I want to throw some dissonance at us. The scripture says that God will never leave us nor forsake us. However, I believe he's forsaken us. I believe he has forsaken the world. He's forsaken our country. But where he doesn't forsake is the individual. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to apologize to Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> because I have compared Joe Biden with our brother Nebuchadnezzar. And I want to apologize to Nebuchadnezzar. And I said, Joe Biden will be to the United States what Nebuchadnezzar was to the Jewish state. But that's not true. And I'm sorry. Because Joe Biden is far worse than anything Nebuchadnezzar was. Far worse. When they came to Nebuchadnezzar and said, King, make a law that at a certain time during the day, you blow the trumpet, everybody has to bow and worship you. Well, okay, that sounds good to me. I think you should be worshiping me anyway. And so he made that law. And so for a while, they practiced it, and then they went and they spied on Daniel and, and uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they came back to the king, and they said, King, there's three people in your administration that's not bowing. There's three Jew, four Jews. And they said, King, you've made this a law. Now you have to obey the law and do to them what you said you would do to them if they didn't bow. And he goes, absolutely. Who were they? Well, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the king was, oh, man. They said, King, it's a law. You have to obey it. King said, oh, you're right. I have to obey the law. Joe Biden, since he has taken office, is breaking every law in the book. He hasn't obeyed one law. I mean, the Constitution, what Constitution? He has just shattered, riddled the Constitution. He obeys nothing. So I apologize to our brother Nebuchadnezzar. Now, one of the things that you can look at today and see, this is remarkable. I got this as an email the other day from Time Magazine, and it's an article, and it, it says, why everyone is so rude right now. Why everyone is so rude. And this is from Time Magazine. September 2021 was a bad month for manners. On the 21st, a woman pulled a gun on servers at a Philadelphia fast food restaurant when they asked her to order online. On the 16th, several women from Texas pummeled a hostess at a New York City family-style restaurant. A few days prior to that, a Connecticut mother was investigated for slapping an elementary school bus driver. And that same week, a California woman was charged with felony assault for attacking a Southwest Airlines flight attendant and dislodging some of her teeth. Re-entry into polite society is proving to be pretty difficult. Just a little bit more. Of course, it's the people have lost their ever-loving minds, incidents that make the news, but they are also a reflection of a deeper trend Americans appear to have forgotten their necessities, their niceties, especially with those with whom job it is to assist them. Lawyers are reporting, reporting ruder clients. Restaurants are reporting ruder clients. 
flight attendants for whom rude clients are no novelty are reporting mayhem. FAA fines for unruly behavior have already exceeded a million dollars this year. So legend are the reports of discourtesy that some customers facing businesses have been forced to play Miss Manners. In other words, they are gone. Visitors, last one. Visitors to the Indiana University Health System are now greeted by a sign that reads, please take responsibility for the energy you bring into this place. Your behavior matters. The Cleveland Clinic uses what it calls behavioral contracts when patients' behavior is continually difficult. The clinic issued nine such contracts in 2017. So far this year, they've issued over 111. I've said this before. It's like a computer. The firewalls are missing in our society. They're virtually gone. There's nothing to buffer people's behaviors anymore. What just a year or two ago seemed to be out of bounds, you guys. Today, those out of bound lines are completely wiped away. And it is to the place now where anything goes. There are no moral guidelines anymore. It's like we have entered a new season of a Sodom and Gomorrah in our country and the world. And I've got applications and stories here to share with us just for a second. The point that I want to make here this morning is, and I've said this before, that it's so, so understandable that the favored hand of God has been lifted off of the world, has been lifted off of our country. And I believe God has forsaken the world. He has not forsaken the individual believer, but he has forsaken the world. Just like in Nebuchadnezzar's time. God raised up Nebuchadnezzar to put Jerusalem, to conquer Jerusalem, <coughs> excuse me, Jerusalem and Israel, and to take Jews, put them into slavery, and he took 6,000 Jews back into his own administration to run his world, so to speak. God did not forsake Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We know the stories, right? But he had forsaken the state of Israel to put them into bondage to teach them a lesson. And I believe God has forsaken the world, has forsaken the United States of America to teach the church, to teach preachers to teach people and it's relevant by seeing and understanding the incredible bondages and slavery that we are in today that the world is in today that the Middle East is in today so I don't know if you saw this on the news they showed a little toddler in in Afghanistan a little toddler boy he had a teddy bear and he had a saw and he was sawing the head off of the teddy bear. And then the next picture showed him holding the teddy bear's head with a great big smile, dressed like one of their soldiers. And he was a toddler, I would say anywhere from two to four years old. People. We have an incredible crisis at our southern border. The United States of America is being invaded by aliens. I've said this before, I've preached it, that before the coming of the Lord, the United States has to be conquered because we're the last nation on earth that hasn't been conquered yet to the point where that all of our morals, all of our standards, and we're the country God created to spread the gospel throughout the world. That gospel has been spread throughout the world. 
And what does the scripture say? When the gospel has been preached to all the world, then the end will come. And people, we are right there. We are right there. So in all these crises, now I heard this on the news the other day. I don't know if you've heard this or not, but it is, it is just staggering. When you think you've heard it all, Biden comes up with something brand new. Did you hear this? Where that on Thursday, October 28th, just this last Thursday, the Wall Street Journal reported this. That the Biden administration, and it's really not Joe, it's Susan Rice and all those other people that are really pulling all the strings and pushing the buttons that served in Obama's administration. That the Biden administration is in talks now to offer immigrant families that were separated during the Trump administration. Did you hear this on the news? You didn't hear it? Okay, all right, so this is new to, to you. Families that were separated at the southern border during the Trump administration. Okay. They were all traumatized. First of all, they broke our laws coming into our country. So we captured them, we separated the children from the adults just like we do today. I lived it, I was in it for years. An officer would come into our office, a police officer would cuff and stuff a criminal on his or her way out, they'd be crying, but what about my children, what about my children? When you throw him or her into prison, they separate the children from those criminal parents. That's just the way it is. And so when you break our laws and you come into our country illegally, you get separated from children and parents because there's stuff that you have to work out. Well, the Biden administration now is saying they're having talks to offer those immigrant families that were separated during the Trump administration, get this, $450,000 a person in reparation compensation. $450,000 per person. When a military, one of our own citizens, goes over and fights a war and gets killed, that person's spouse only gets $400,000 as a death supplement for being killed in war. They are now talking about every single person who was separated during the Trump administration, which is thousands of people, to now give each one of them $450,000 in reparation compensation, and the U.S. Department of Justice, Homeland Security, and Health and Human Services are considering payments that could amount close to one million dollars per family. One million dollars per family for breaking our laws mm -hmm. and coming into our country. That's our money. That's our money. These are illegal aliens that have, are invading our country. And hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands, you see it on the news, are coming. There's another 20,000 caravan people, cops in, in uh, uh, what's below us? Mexico. 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 We're standing with shields trying to block them. This 20,000 caravan locked arms and hands chanting, you cannot stop us, and busted through that wall of policemen in Mexico like a hot knife going through soft butter. And they're coming our way. I don't know if you've heard this. But even a year ago, this, was, this would never have been considered appropriate or okay. Folks, 
the devil and this movement is going after now our little children. Not after college students, not after high school students, but our children. As slow as kindergarten, they now have pornography books. Have you heard the story? Pornography books. They're now teaching over in Virginia and Carolinas and over in the East Coast. It's now growing. Pornography. Books with pornography. Pornographic books for grade school kids. Children. And so some parents are outraged about it. So they go before the school board and they bring one of these books that kindergartners, first, second, third graders are reading and the teachers read to them. And so the parents stand in front of the school board and start reading. I want to share with you what's being taught in our grade schools. And they start reading. And after a certain amount of time, the school board president stopped them and said, stop, 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 stop. I want to stop you there. The language that you are using is inappropriate for our setting right here. So it's, it's bad for adults, but yet we're teaching it to kindergartners. Adults can't handle it, but we're giving it to five-year-olds for crying out loud. And I saw this on the news the other day. Pornographic pictures. They're promoting homosexuality. Pictures. Men with men. Women with women. Showing genitalia. Female and male genitalia in these pictures. Oral sex being taken and done. Men with men and women with women and vice versa for our little children in our grade schools. They showed now in, in some high schools, now when they have assemblies, that they're doing mock rapes. Mock rapes. And some kids they sit on a chair and then they, they give mock lap dances. And so while there's a mock rape going on and mock lap dances, all the other thousands of kids are applauding and cheering as loud as they can. Does it get any hellier sure than that? Shame on everybody. Shame on the United States of America. Shame on the church and preachers that have put down the last 40 years. Preachers have extinguished conviction. Yeah. Yeah. Fearing right. Amen. they might offend someone. Right. Yeah. In case, I don't care whether you agree with this or not, in case you think maybe I'm, you know, this is just right now, I have always preached this. We were the fastest growing Assemblies of God Church in the Northwest District years ago, and I stood on our platform right here in our church and I preached to three, four rows of teenagers in our church. And every time to time, I would address sexual issues. And I would say to the teenage girls, keep your pants on. And to the teenage boys, keep it in your pants. Not afraid of embarrassing or offending anybody, but just saying, there's a certain amount of appropriateness. Now, sometimes people make mistakes. Kids make mistakes. I get that. We all get that, right? The point that I'm trying to make to you right now as a preacher, I have always preached this. I have always preached a certain amount of morality and correctness and rightness from the very beginning. So this is not something that, that I'm bringing on us right now because I think it's important. I have always made this thing. If I could use the term in my preaching career, pornography. I've said this before. I've talked with educators. And you see little children. And a few years ago when I was working in Genesee, and one day I walked up to the principal and I said, you know what, Mrs. So-and-so? I said, you know what the problem is with little children today? I said, they have no shame. 
She went, oh, you're exactly right, Daryl. She said, there is no shame. And I said, with no shame, there can be no correction. Yep. Amen. All we do is just remove the child out of the space to change their behavior. The behavior never gets changed. We just eliminate it for a moment from this setting. But with, where there is no shame, there can be no correction. And you see, former Senator Ron Paul, and I've been saying this now, now for years, Ron Paul was on the news the other day, and he said the corruption, the political corruption in Washington, D.C., he says now, is, is so much worse than when I was there. He said it's just completely out of control. And he said the reason that it's out of control is he said there's no more shame in our politics. And yet we have preachers today that diminish and even put down and mock repentance yeah. and conviction. You see, folks, here's the deal. Where there is no shame, there is no conviction. And where there is no conviction, there is no God. Yeah. There is no God. Look at it. Look at everything that I've been saying this morning and that I've been reading and saying and quoting newspapers and people. There is no more shame. Why is there no more shame? Because God has forsaken the world. Now, for those who think, well, that's ball humbug. You know, that's, that's, you know, that's just wrong, whatever. No, 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 no. As Christian people, that potentially could be some of the best news we've ever heard. Because God can only take so much of this and then he's coming back and when he comes back, it's the end and we're out of here. Somebody shout amen. We're out of here. We're gone. You see, understand the sequence. If God the Father has forsaken the world, which I say he has, the individual believer, absolutely not. My God will never leave Daryl Stavros nor forsake him. Amen. In fact, I want more of God. I told God the other day I said, in my prayer, I said, God, I want more. I want more of you. I want more of you. I want more blessings. I'm not satisfied. I want more. Uh, Lord, I want more of you. And he'll answer those prayers. Yes. But the world, the political status, the financial status, the social status, the the educational, God has forsaken the world. And what that means is, after he has forsaken the world, and we become Sodom and Gomorrah once again, God the Father will say, I've had enough. Amen. Because you see, what follows what I've been talking about is the judgment of God. And that judgment of God is in the Lord Jesus Christ coming back. Greeting his believers. Those, the bride of Christ that are ready for him. We shall meet him in the air. We will receive our judgment. We were counted worthy to escape his wrath. And for those who are left behind, they do not want to be left behind. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, man, folks. Oh, I'm just telling you. Turn your Bibles now, please. I want to read it real quick, some scripture. Now, I don't have time. If I was preaching for an hour, an hour and a half, I could read all the scripture, but I don't need to do that. You know what it is, or you can look it up and find it on your own. But turn to Hebrews chapter 13. I first want to read this, read another scripture, and then we're going to worship the Lord for a season. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 13, beginning with verse 1. Let brotherly love continue. Oh my word, can we even find that anymore? Verse 2. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember them that are in bonds and as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. Verse 4. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. That means a married man and a married woman, you know, take it to the bedroom and do as you please. 
But warmongers and adulterers, God will judge. And that's exactly what's going on today. We have warmongering. The stuff that's happening in our public schools, you guys, with this pornographic illustrations and books, that's warmongering. Not only is it an abomination to God, but that's warmongering. And anybody involved in warmongering will never get as high as they can jump. Yes. Verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Can you say amen? amen? So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. You see, I will not fear what man shall do unto me. And that's what's going on right now. But you see, as individual believers, we have the protection of God. God is no longer protecting the world. We're just out there. They're just out there. But those of us that are apart, listen, folks, we're the bride of Christ. Amen. We're not created for the wrath of God. We're the bride of Christ. Amen. We're the spiritual firstborn. That means that we have a privilege in heaven. And when the judgment of God falls upon this earth, we are going to escape that judgment. We are the bride of Christ. And the Father, someday soon, I believe we will not see the next presidential election. Can you imagine Jesus Christ coming back within the next year and a half? Amen. Hallelujah. I mean, what do you see? What do you see? For those of you that are watching this on our website, when you think of going to heaven, what do you see? That's freaky. That's freaky. Gonna, we're going to go. And then we're going to go into heaven where it's glorious and we're going to see the face of God. Mm -hmm. Folks, I have been preaching this, praying this, singing about this, promoting this my entire life. And to think that I may never see natural death but the one that I've been praying to, preaching about, talking about, looking forward to seeing my entire life, that someday soon, I'm going to meet him in the air. i got to tell you something. I'm excited. Do I look excited? How do, what do I need to do to look excited? I can't jump up and down and jump over pews like I used to. You know, I used to be a really good out. I can't do that now. And let me try it. No, just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. I'm already bleeding like a stuck pig this morning. I don't even know how it happened. Somebody say amen. amen. Hebrews chapter 3, and then we're going to worship the Lord. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 6. Turn to it real quick. Turn to the left a few pages. Oh, my word. This is so awesome. And verse 6. Hebrews 3, 6 reads like this. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are. Whose house? We're the house of Jesus Christ. Amen. And for those of you watching this this morning, God is in this sanctuary this morning. Wow. There are angels with us here this morning. Wow. I feel great today wow. because God is in this place. Wow. Hallelujah. Let's look at this. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence, if we hold fast and the rejoicing of the hope, firm until the end, we will meet the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and all of this filth, this filth and foul, that I have brought to us this morning. We will escape God's judgment on the filth of the world and we will rejoice with Him forever. Amen. Hallelujah. For seven years during the tribulation period, 
we're going to be up there eating the feast of the Passover lamb with all the other saints in heaven. And then we're coming back to reign. Can you, I asked Linda this the other day. I said, think about this. And then we're coming back to reign for a thousand years. The earth will repopulate itself and there will be peace for a thousand years. And we're going to reign with him. And I said, what do you think we're going to be doing? Do you think we'll be playing football? You don't think we can play golf? I mean, it's going to be like normal, except the lion will lay down with the lamb. And I thought, okay, I want to be a head coach. So where do I want to be a head football coach? Because I want the God to know this, right? Because for a thousand years, I want to be the winningest coach. <laughs> you get my dress, right? Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Let's all stand. Let's worship the Lord for a season, shall we? Praise the name of Jesus.